So, Michael, uh, positive mental health and well-being is a very strong ethos in Northern Ireland Ambulance Service. And recently, you held a Zoom meeting with staff members about staff well-being and support of staff. Can you give us an outline of what kind of support uh, mechanisms uh, staff from the Northern Ireland Ambulance Service are uh, benefiting from? Well, it's a hugely important area for me, Declan. I think we all know the very challenging roles that our staff perform, the sorts of issues that they deal with and the things that they see on a day-to-day -day basis. And that was exacerbated during the, the, the COVID um, pandemic. Uh, so, so we put in place a range of mechanisms or built on existing ones, certainly making sure we have increased management uh, support available to staff. Uh, we, we put in place an operational support unit, 16 hours a day, seven days a week. And where staff can uh, contact to ask for advice in relation to, particularly again in the early early stages when uh, there was changing guidance regularly um, in relation to the use of, of PPE and so on. Uh, we provided accommodation for staff if they need it, if they need to be able to uh, stay away from their family home. Uh, we provided food for staff so that we could at least make sure uh, we, we were uh, providing them with, with regular meals. Um, and we have, we were very fortunate in NIAS to have a, an existing peer support team where we have about 30 staff trained as peer supporters. So we enhanced that team um, during the pandemic and they were able to provide welfare calls to staff who were uh, tested positive who, or who were self-isolating. They were also available for staff to contact them for support if they were feeling uh, particularly anxious or, or after difficult, difficult calls. And we worked with the five other health and social care trusts in, in Northern Ireland to make sure that every member of staff was able to access uh, psychological support in their local trust area. Uh, and, and we have a contract uh, with an organisation called Inspire who provide counselling and a range of other advice and support for staff. And we strengthened that during, uh, during the pandemic. Is there something, Michael, that would have occurred that spurred that sort of drive for uh, staff well-being? Was there a kind of, uh, I won't say history, but a pattern of staff uh, expressing welfare issues? When I took up post, um, I started contacting staff directly who had been involved in um, particularly traumatic calls that I heard about or any incidents where staff had been assaulted, which unfortunately, as you know, are, are, are all too frequent. Uh, and, and I picked up through those conversations with staff that there perhaps wasn't the level of immediate support available to, to staff after incidents such as that. So um, that's when we started to put that program of work in place and establishing our, our peer support. But it was very clear in the early days of the pandemic back in, in March time uh, that staff really were quite anxious and, and we, we were mindful from the, 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 the queries that we were getting of the need to put in place something uh, much, more, much more robust, much more reliable uh, across, uh, across the day. Um, and that's where we strengthen those arrangements. Okay, and of course, improving the service of any business or organisation is vital. Uh, and on Thursday, World Quality Day took place. Uh, the Northern Ireland Ambulance Service Patient Care Services Review Team were thanked for their ongoing work and commitment. Um, there's also a weekly meeting, Michael, of the safeguarding team. Um, what's the role in the NIAS of the safeguarding team? Well, the safeguarding team comes under the responsibility of our director of safety quality improvement and as part of our overall program of continuous improvement around the safety and quality of our service um, the, the, the director of safety and quality chairs a weekly meeting of, of a range of clinical staff where we review safeguarding referrals that have been made in the previous uh, week to identify any areas where they could be improved upon, where our referral processes could be improved upon, to identify any learning from those referrals where perhaps there's training needs that are, are, are required across the organization and to provide feedback to those staff who've been involved in, in those uh, difficult cases. We have similar arrangements in place in relation to serious adverse incidents that are reported um, during each week. Uh, in relation to complaints that are received e each week. And it's all part of that program of trying to improve the safety and quality of the service that uh, we provide, something that we all must continue to do. It'll be a continuous journey and we must continue to, to, to build on that, learn from what works well, learn from what perhaps hasn't gone so well and see how we can change our processes and our, our practices as a result. Very good. And you mentioned about training, Michael. I suppose over the last few months, has COVID 
obviously it has brought some sort of restrictions in trainings, but what level of disruption or interruption has COVID caused to training within the Northern Ireland Ambulance Service? Well, certainly at the start of the pandemic, uh, Declan, it, it was very disruptive um, for two, two main reasons. Um, at that stage, we had to make sure that we had all of our available clinical staff um, available to support frontline uh, pressures. That meant both training staff, so the staff in, in, our, in, in our training team, uh, requiring them to take on different roles, but also to release students back into operational uh, our operational duties. Uh, the, the other challenge that we faced was actually delivering training uh, traditionally in a classroom environment that just all of a sudden was not possible because of the, the need for social distancing. So um, reluctantly, we stood training down um, at the end of March. I say reluctantly, given the, the, the vitally important role that the training has. Um, that, that remained stood down, remained paused through to about the end of June. Uh, when we gradually started to uh, re-establish training in particular to get our, our students, our student EMTs, our student paramedics uh, back into training because we, we need a supply, an ongoing uh, supply of our workforce. So our training department, I have to say, worked uh, extremely hard, very innovative um, in how they would deliver training moving forward. So we have moved to deliver as much training as possible on digital platforms uh, where that's not possible and people must come uh, together face to face. We're doing that obviously observing social distancing and where there's practical hands-on training. Uh, our, our, our training staff and our students are all wearing the full level of PPE that uh, they would be uh, wearing if they were actually out doing the job to ensure that they're, they're doing that in, in a safe environment. Is there any type of the training, Michael, overall uh, across the, the ambulance service that you would have seen said was a priority and it has to be done, it has to be continued, even with the restrictions, as difficult as it was? Well, well our priority, Declan, has been and continues to be training staff uh, to, to increase our, our workforce. So all of the training is necessary. We wouldn't be tr doing training if it wasn't uh, addressing people's skills and, and, uh, and ensuring they can do the job uh, safely and to, to the highest standards. But we have prioritised uh, having training that will produce more staff that, that we need. So, for example, we currently have two emergency medical technician um, training programmes underway. In fact, we had two programmes that, that graduated in July. We started another two, two straight away. Um, we've recently started more ambulance care attendant uh, training and we are prioritizing our foundation degree for student paramedics. Uh, they are due to graduate. They were due to graduate this month in November. Unfortunately, that was delayed. They're now due to graduate in, in February. And um, we're also uh, training. We've got two cohorts of emergency medical dispatchers being trained currently, and uh, we will have them all available taking calls before Christmas. So we, we really have prioritised the training of our staff that will expand our workforce, give us that resilience to, to uh, deal with the increasing pressures and also the ongoing challenge of high numbers of staff not available for work at any time because they're self-isolating. And you mentioned about uh, staff there, Michael. I know you've had the new uh, paramedics coming on board and you've also recently appointed control room uh, dispatchers, emergency ambulance dispatchers. Um, I suppose Intermittently, I'd see on Twitter, on the Northern Ireland Ambulance Service Twitter um, posts saying that uh, the ambulance service is uh, extremely busy and they're going to be prioritising calls and so on. What kind of calls, Michael, are creating that busyness around the Northern Ireland Ambulance Service? And The, the broad range of, of, of calls, Declan, we receive between six and six, six to seven hundred calls per day. Um, that's we're currently consistently having about a quarter of those are still COVID related. So patients with uh, suspected uh, COVID. So that obviously presents a, a challenge. But other than that, we're seeing the full range. P people are still continuing to get ill for the same reasons. People are still involved in uh, in accidents, in emergencies, in the same way. And we're we're seeing the, the full uh, the full range of those. Where we're having a particular challenge and where it's a particular uh, pressure for our, our uh, the staff in our control room, um, is really linked to the operational pressures that we're facing. So we do have about twenty percent of our operational staff not available for work at, at any time. 
Um, we're also experiencing lengthy delays at emergency departments handing over patients, given the, the challenges there are in emergency departments. That all leads to, at any point in time, we have a number of calls waiting without any ambulance resource to, to, to uh, deploy to it. That results very often in repeated calls. So uh, people understandably are phoning uh, back a number of times to get an update on where the ambulance is, which puts a pressure on our control room staff. They're also having to stay on the line with many more patients than they would have previously because they're not able um, to dispatch an ambulance as quickly. That takes up some of their, their time. Um, and that, that, that general pressure of knowing that you've got people on the call who are in a, a high state of stress, very anxious, and you know at that stage you cannot deploy an ambulance and you're telling them that and you're apologizing for that. And perhaps at times asking people if they're able to make their own way to an emergency department, that all makes for that job to be in, extremely difficult at this present time. And, and those sort of uh, restrictions, Michael, they're very, very similar in the National Ambulance Service South. Um, I suppose before I go on to one or two other questions, just based on the uh, cross-border collaboration, would there be much of a link in with the National Ambulance Service uh, in the border counties? Yes, we work very closely uh, with our colleagues in, in the National Ambulance Service and indeed at times when we're under particular pressure, um, we have sought their support and been provided uh, with that, where they've, they, they, they've assisted us uh, and the, the same arrangement works the other way. But there's also uh, a fair bit of, in, particularly in the border areas, where we would respond to, to calls in the south and uh, equally our colleagues in the National Ambulance Service would uh, respond to some calls here. So in that regard, we do, uh, we do not uh, re regard the border, who, whoever is in the, the, the the, the best position, the quickest position to respond to, to a call, uh, we do that and our colleagues in the National Ambulance Service do it likewise and we're very grateful for their support. Very good and I suppose finally Michael, the public see the ambulance paramedics, the patient care service staff and so on, but behind the scenes they never see the people who take the call in the first instance. Uh, only a couple of weeks ago was International Control Operators Day. Um, you paid tribute to the control room operators because I suppose in your own words they're unsung heroes. Well, they're, they're unsung heroes, as you say, Declan, perhaps in the eyes of the public, who, who don't tend to see them. They're, they're obviously not out there visible on the road and, and responding to people's homes, but they're certainly uh, not forgotten or, or unsung uh, in my eyes or in the eyes of the organisation. And there's a lot of uh, reference to that term frontline staff. It means different things to different people. But in, in my view, are the staff in our emergency ambulance control and indeed in our non-emergency ambulance control room are absolutely frontline. They are the first point of contact with people when they enter the system. You think of all of the care and treatment that people will get that follows on from that, from our crews res responding to them, providing a high level of uh, care and treatment at scene, taking them to an emergency department where they receive all ongoing care and treatment and, and the whole pathway after that. That all starts with that 999 call and the person who answers it. Uh, and very often the person who answers that uh, call is the first person who's providing the calm voice, the reassuring voice. Uh, our, our EMDs deliver babies. Um, they, they give CPR advice to, to families and the bystanders that save people's lives. They talk to people who are at the highest state of distress and very often are able to, to calm them at a time when they're at risk of, of harming themselves. It's a really difficult job not being able to have those eyes on someone doing that all over the telephone is extremely challenging. I think it's one of the most pressurised and difficult jobs in the ambulance service. So um, I'm certainly keen that they are not left as, as unsung heroes, but that they're recognised and celebrated for the incredible work they do. Absolutely, here, here, and, and they are indeed unsung heroes. Uh, Michael Bloomfield, Chief Executive of Northern Ireland Ambulance Service, thanks very much indeed for joining me. And I suppose for any of our followers, if you want to keep up to date with any of the activities of Northern Ireland Ambulance Service, you can follow them on Twitter at NIAS999. Michael, thanks very much indeed for joining me. Thank you, Declan.